Thank you. Namaskar. Uh, as many of you may be aware, uh, I come from a background of uh, what you described today, BPL, below the poverty line. So I have very first-hand experience of what it takes to be poor and what it means to be poor. And therefore, most of my 30 odd years now in Scotch have been dedicated to a single cause of inclusive growth, which is keeping on moving Indians up the economic ladder. You know, uh, poor should come out of poverty. Uh, those who have come out of poverty should become middle class. Those who are middle class should move in the uh, upper middle class and so on and so forth. Now, this very vision has been articulated by the Honorable Prime Minister when he talks about the Amrit Kal or India 2047. We have only 25 years left to defeat poverty and make sure that every Indian is outside the uh, clutches of this devil called poverty. Uh, by 2047, we expect to be a developed country. By 2047, we are going to be uh, about a 30 trillion economy. But what is the basis of uh, all this? What is the foundation of all this? Has that been laid? And what is it that has been done? So it just uh, reminds me of a conversation that I had with, uh, at that time, Chief Minister Modi in September 2013 in Nagar. That was the time a very senior economist in the ruling party had made a statement uh, saying that Modi ji's knowledge of economics can fit behind a postage stamp. So I was called by Modi ji since I was studying Gujarat and other states for nearly 15 years before that. And he said, uh, Kochar ji, what do you think about my knowledge of uh, economics? And I said, sir, I think the knowledge of economics is about the same, only the approach is different. An economist would tend to have a pure economic approach but your approach is that of inclusive governance and inclusive economics. And truly so, if you look at 1991, from when the reforms panned out, India did huge opening up of the economy, a lot of things were liberalized, but there was close to zero go uh, reform on uh, governance. Now that has kind of caught momentum and really improved since 2014, ever since Mr. Modi uh, uh, came in. So when we say inclusive growth, what is the meaning of inclusive growth? Uh, we've been working on inclusive growth for longer than that, since uh, the inception of Scotch, which is 1997, uh, even before the term was coined. So to us, inclusive growth basically has three ways to be handled. It stands on three pillars. One is digital inclusion, financial inclusion, and social inclusion. These are the three tools that are available to India to bring people out of uh, poverty. So if you look at the last one decade and the performance of digital India, you find that digital services are absolutely ubiquitous. Payments are available to everybody. Uh, Jandhan Aadhaar Mobile has done wonders. Uh, same thing with uh, uh, financial inclusion. Every India is now a universally banked country. Practically everybody has uh, a bank account and access to financial services. And a lot of stuff has been done on uh, social services as well. But at the same time, like Gursharan mentioned, that policy making is uh, science and an art. And in India, it is more of an art because there are no statistics. But unfortunately, I think in India, we have perfected. Uh, the science of converting statistics or making statistics into an art. It's an art form rather than a science form uh, in India. And they're very, you know, because first of all, very little of it is available. It is very selective and, you know, it can be interpreted any which way and it hides a lot more than it tells. So any uh, policy that's made on pure statistics is uh, going to be quite a challenge. So what Scotch has been doing is we have focused ourselves on what we call socio-economic research or qualitative research, 
where we do project level fighting. So when you say statistics in India, you know, you get only very broad level macro statistics. So, you know, you'll see the government saying the poverty has gone down and you'll see using the same data opposition saying the poverty has gone up. So you go figure, you know, which one is uh, true. So obviously there is something wrong in the construct if the changes or the interpretations are so wide. So when we talked about India becoming a developed country by 2047, what is it that we need for this inclusive growth? What we need is spatially dispersed, job generative, equitable and lately sustainable growth. You know, you keep talking about post-COVID, you talk about K-shaped recovery, you are saying handful of Indians are getting rich and then all kinds of uh, data floating around. But did the ordinary lot of Indians benefit? So the, the first answer there comes from was this growth that we are seeing spatially dispersed across states? Did every state grow? Was the growth equitable and poverty reducing? Did this growth have any impact on people coming out of poverty? were jobs generative and was it sustainable? Now to five I don't have an answer, it's work in progress but on the first four is something that we have been working on and uh, Shamika will bear me out that uh, if you look at official data is, is grossly uh, inadequate or it's very informal statistics that is available and we use all kinds of proxies to, to prove our point uh, one way or the other. Uh, other. Fortunately, we have a timeline of 25 years of collecting such data and we, how do we do it is we actually go down to the project level. So we look at each state, let's say we take the base year, let's say as 2014 and we say in 2014, which state did what in 35 different indicators. So it could be agriculture, it could be availability, women and child development, it could be tribal welfare, it could be revenue, it could be economy. So these 35 indicators are measured state after state. Now how do we measure? Now people can say it can, it can be politically colored, it can be not neutral. So what is the best source of data? We actually invite the state itself, whether it's an opposition state or a ruling party state, to identify their own good work and tell us why it is good. So there is very comprehensive documentation goes. There is an equal opportunity for every state to fill that up. And then after that it goes through a four month process of expert evaluation, jury evaluation, and finally, you know, coming to a stage where it can be rated and ranked. I'm sometimes amazed, actually more appalled at most of the awards that are just handed out, where, you know, you just put in a one page uh, nomination and your jury is top 10 CEOs of India who barely have time to run their own uh, companies, how would they get time to listen to 2,000 presentations or 5,000 presentations? So if you look at Scotch, each presentation is heard directly by four different people and then there are mystery visits, fees visits, there are beneficiary votings. It's a very, very long process and well-hold methodology that goes into. So, this data is sort of uh, bulletproof and therefore we are able to extrapolate it and present it somewhat better than the official statistics. So first let us look at uh, some data which is available uh, publicly, it is available from government but we've only tried to analyze it. So if you look at uh, economic growth, there's a lot of discussion about did India, is Indian economy growing is the Indian economy not growing? Is it adequate growth? Is it? And they are also talking about that there is padding up and there is, you know, uh, whose word to take and whose word not to take. One data which is actually uh, beyond doubt is the data of NSDP, uh, the state domestic product, because that data comes from the states. It does not come from the center. So if you look at these 2014 to 2023, the lowest NSDP growth has been in Jharkhand, which was 6.75%, and highest is Madhya Pradesh, 
which is 12.22%. So if you just look at a decadal growth rate between the lowest state and the highest state, you would find it is far beyond what is possibly going on anywhere else in the world. And sigma of all the states is finally what reflects uh, a substantial part of the uh, national GDP. So all states have grown. No state is negative. No, none of them is zero. The lowest is 6.75. So when I say inclusive growth, no state left behind. This is what I mean. Every state had grown at a minimum of 6.75%. Then we come to, so has this reduced poverty? Now we have this big debate always, you know, first of all, it's almost impossible to define uh, poverty. There have been very, very many definitions uh, used uh, for poverty, while the most commonsensical way as a practitioner of poverty, I'd say is that poverty means I don't have money. So you should measure it in money. It is far more complex than that. It is not easy to uh, measure it only in uh, monetary terms. So there are people who say that, you know, our government is coming out with this mumbo jumbo called multidimensional poverty because they're saying if you get food, you get health, you get education. These are also parameters of multidimensional poverty. The fact is this mumbo jumbo was not made by our government, it was made by UNDP and Oxford many years back. And so UNDP does a measurement of multidimensional poverty across countries because, you know, if you don't have food to eat, how do you measure your income? I mean, you know, you are barely surviving and there is no methodology available. So, so that then becomes a very good yardstick. So if you look at state by state, so when NSDP of Madhya Pradesh uh, grew 12.22% rank 1 the, in, in terms of uh, multidimensional poverty reduction was the second highest. And in terms of social sector expenditure in these 10 years, it was the 10th highest. Now, you would say that why is it that if it is ranking 1 in NSDP, it is not number 1 in reduction in poverty and it is certainly uh, very number 10 in social sector spending. The fact is GDP is only one factor that impacts poverty. It's not the only one. Actually, even slow GDP can remove poverty. It is a distribution of GDP that impacts poverty. So suppose you say, you know, your income is one crore as a family and the elder brother gets 90 lakhs and the younger brother gets 10 lakhs. So you, can, you cannot average it out as their income and say that this is a, this is a family with 45 lakh. Uh, average income. It doesn't work out like that. So unless until the younger brother also gets a significant amount, the poverty is not going to uh, go away. Okay. And more than expenditure on social sector, it just says how much money are you spending, but it's not measuring any outcomes. But unfortunately, from the government side or RBI side, this is the data that is available. And clearly a lot more is required. So you find if you do a correlation between uh, CAGR of NSDP and multidimensional poverty reduction or social sector expenditure or uh, headcount, you will find it is inversely proportional, but it is a weak inverse proportion. So as the growth goes up, poverty goes down, but does it go down in the same ratio? The answer is no. That relationship is weak. So clearly there are some other factors that need to be taken care of. And we have calculated this data for all the states. So this is the lowest figure of uh, Jharkhand, which grew at 6.75%, rank 32. But in multidimensional in poverty index, while it was the slowest growth, it ranks number five. Lot, and if you look at even Bihar would be a very uh, similar uh, situation. And on social sector expenditure, Jharkhand is number eight. So what are the other factors that are uh, important for determining whether the growth is inclusive or not? One of course is there is an importance of 
reliable data for policy making, which I just showed you. There is very little data available, and it doesn't really make sense unless somebody you know puts it to a deeper massaging and analysis. Uh, our national surveys have been uh, the primary source of data for the first lot of data that I showed, but these are poorly constructed and not often not reliable. And I'll give you, you know, homilies. How does the survey happen? I remember when we were children, uh, this uh, lady from Surf used to come for survey, you know, Hindustan leavers. And she used to come and ask my mother, and we used to live in Pahargan, and you know, we could barely get two square meals. And he would ask, which uh, washing powder you use? Actually, we were using desi sabun ki chakki. But my mother would tell her, we hum to surf use karte hai. You know, because her self-esteem would go up. You know, it's very difficult to acknowledge that you use desi sabun ki uh, chakki. So you'll get an incorrect answer. Similarly, if somebody would, uh, you know, come to your house and ask you for your income, okay, uh, so what is your income bracket? And, you know, a large part of Indian economy is... Uh, informal. So you will tend to understate your income, thinking that this guy is from income tax and you may get raided. Even if he is not, I mean, he is just from some sabun company or soap company or television channel. He is just figuring out what your income bracket is. And you will, if you are really rich and you have black money, you will tend to really, really understate it. Similarly, there used to be a time when rural-urban was a very clear divide. Today, our rural where urban ends and rural starts, it's a continuum. You really don't know what is rural, what is urban. So how do you do these definitions? So there is a serious problem that we uh, have there. So what are the other things that you can do which are independent of the national service? So one ratio is what we call financial deepening. This was a methodology developed by the World Bank. Last time it was done for India was 2011. And we have been able to uh, reconstruct that. Financial deepening basically means people like us, Indians, how strong are our economic institutions, what is the kind of economic uh, uh, activity or infrastructure that we have uh, built. It is crucial for fostering economic growth. It facilitates saving, mobilization, efficiency of capital allocation, and risk management. So this is where you find that uh, India has done incredibly well in 13 14 our financial deepening ratio was 19.71 this is all the financial sector put together which is in 21 22 31.85 so this is your markets this is your banks your financial institutions you know all of that put together that data now this is not a figure that any government uh, setup gives you. So it is Scotch's analysis and we have you know, done a lot of effort calculating this to answer uh, when you say that whether there is jobs and there is no jobs. So I say if there is economic activity, there will always be jobs. And there is financial deepening. And we have already shown that the growth which is also coming out of economic activity is spatially dispersed. So these are the two good parameters. The third parameter, which is very important again, uh, for is access to credit. When you do economic activity, you have to have access to credit. I mean, you have a bank account, but do you have access to credit? Okay. So the first survey on this was done, uh, uh, again, I think in 2011. Uh, there was a committee formed called uh, Rangarajan Committee, which came out with a financial inclusion plan. So, so no shade or party can uh, argue with the methodology because you know they said that the credit outreach gap in 2011 is uh, 0.41, and uh, th sorry the. Uh, the credit gap is, sorry, in, uh, in 2011 it was 90%, 90.03%. And in 22, it has come down to 76.68%. Extra floating to 23, we should be close to about 70%. So an enormous amount of credit infusion through SHGs, through Pradhan Mantri Mudra Yojana, through Swanadhi Yojana, so many Yojanas that have been 
put together have made this credit available to a much larger number of uh, people and uh, we have a detailed report on this where we have been able to go down to the district level and calculate credit outreach gap district by district so which is so the lowest credit the highest credit gap is in the district called kurunkume uh, in arunachal pradesh and then you will find that the least reach of microfinance is also in the district that which uh, needs it the most now but now there is no government statistics that tell you that is only scotch research so so then the question to ask for policy making or input to give to them is if kurunkume is most credit deprived district why is it the microfinance sector is the least active they have only 25 loan accounts in kurunkume district so this is the kind of data and anal analysis that is required now whose fault is it this is 50 60 70 years of statistical system that we have uh, inherited and so there is a big problem on that so conclusions to this is india needs spatially dispersed job generative growth one first conclusion is nsdp of all states uh, reduced uh, in sorry grew between 12.22% of madhya pradesh to 6.75% of jharkhand uh, multi dimensional poverty index of states reduced maximum in bihar lowest in kerala uh, lowest in kerala probably because the lesser number of poor to uh, start with but bihar is a real success story poverty headcount has decreased again maximum number in uh, bihar and lowest in kerala cagr a social sector expenditure which is also some people call it uh, freebies but not all of it is freebies uh, this social sector expenditure that we use is social sector as defined by rbi so the highest was 19.23% cagr and lowest was 6% credit outreach gap has declined and financial de inde deepening index has improved from 1971 Uh, 19.71 in 13-14 to 31.85 in 21-22. Uh, and to come to these conclusions, uh, an additional scotch information that we've added on top of this: in 14-19, we have deep dive studied and documented 1866 projects. This has gone up to 2813. projects in uh, 2023 and as i mentioned it takes four man months for us to evaluate uh, one project so you can multiply and see the kind of humongous effort that goes into it you should you would also be acutely aware of the fact that scotch gets zero funding from anyone we don't get funding from the government we don't get funding from the multilateral institutions so we actually have to earn our own money and spend it on our own research and that money essentially comes from all the exhibitions etc that we um, organize along with uh, the conference that's about the only source of revenue we have but that has resulted in the india's only timeline study on what we call a good governance index we do it two ways one is we have it taking 2014 as a base year five years and five years what has changed and cumulative where india today is which state is number 1 number 2 and the part 2 of the study is what has changed incrementally in the year so while gujarat may be number 1 state uh, nationally cumulatively is that the case for the current year as well which is what we are presenting here so if you look at this chart in the uh, and the chart itself shows you how unbiased it is the number one improvement in good governance index is gujarat number 2 is west bengal number 3 is andhra pradesh then maharashtra then madhya pradesh and odisha telangana you will find it's completely uh, non partisan and for each one of these numbers there is 10 years of data so this is the ranking of states in our other indexes so while gujarat ranks number 1 in governance index 
we have picked up the social sector and constructed a separate index. It has got uh, 12 indicators. Governance has 38 indicators. So social indic indicators could be access to housing, water, women and child development, education, so on and so forth. So on social inclusion index in the 10 years, Gujarat ranks two. And in credit outreach gap, it ranks eight. Same calculation has been done for all of them. With this, I come to the end of part one of my presentation. Uh, part two, I will do after I have a conversation uh, with Shamika. And in part two, I will present the findings for 2023, uh, what happened. But vis-a-vis -vis the part one, if you have any questions, I'd be very happy to take them. No questions? Good. I need someone's help to sort out all my papers which are